morning again. Today we are exploring your scarecrow mind. To remind us how we got to this point, we're doing a series this month called Yellow Bricks Forever, which points to the idea that the streets of heaven are paved with gold, and the idea about loving God and loving neighbor and loving self are sort of those uh, building blocks that help us to understand the role of faith and of hope and of love in our lives, and we're called to live lives fully into that. And so uh, to let us know how we got to this point today, I want to remind you about where we were last week when we talked about your Dorothy soul, your Dorothy soul, looking into the ideas that come from the original biblical languages. The soul is that part of us that integrates your thoughts, your feelings, and your actions also to align you with God's plan because God has a plan and a purpose for your life. We talk about that all the time and We aren't always clear about what that means. The New Testament tells us that the purpose that we have is to be made into the image and the likeness of Jesus Christ. That's what God wants for you. That's the purpose for your life. He wants you to be me, to be, not be be me, I'm sorry, to be made like Jesus. Now, the thing that's interesting about that is he doesn't want us all to be exactly, identically the same. That's not what that's about. He wants us to live freely and fully based on how we have been created and how we are called. Therefore, if we are living into that purpose of God, that means that the individual unique gifts and skills, talents, abilities, all the little things that you have that you are, when you learn to live and to give those to the glory of God, you are fulfilling your purpose to be made into the likeness of Jesus. So this purpose of God that we talk about is to come together in unity based on the commonality of Christ that we have between us, but also to allow those things that are unique and special and awesome and personal of us to be exemplified as we glorify God and God's plan. So our soul is what integrates the things that we think, the things that we feel, the way that we behave as we live into God's plan, which is to be like Jesus, to be fully who we are in that light and that love and that glory of God. And so we talked about how Dorothy was looking for home, right? But we were talking about really specifically how Dorothy was looking for the integration of her soul. Tragedy struck She was either orphaned and or abandoned, and she was sent to go live with Uncle Henry and Auntie M. So whether or not uh, Uncle Henry and Auntie M were actually blood relatives or they were foster family, we don't know for sure based on the backstory of the Wizard of Oz. We do know that Dorothy experienced tragedy in her life, and so she was seeking out that place of belonging. She was seeking out that place where she felt integrated, where she felt complete where she felt like she could be who she was. And she went on her journey of Oz thinking that, that somewhere over the rainbow she would discover that place that brought that integration. But it wasn't somewhere over the rainbow at all, was it? It was what happened when she allowed her life to be realigned so that her thoughts, her heart, her feelings, and her actions were all aligned. This is why we see her companions through Oz was the, the tin man also looking for his heart, the scarecrow looking for his mind, and the lion looking for his courage, looking for his strength. Dorothy is the culmination of those, the soul as it is integrated and unified to show us what it means to be at home when we find our heart and our soul and our mind and our strength aligned and unified with who God is for us and God's purpose for our lives. This would be a good time if you've not done so already to pull out your Hope Church Plus app You have the follow along notes, that way you can uh, keep up with what we're doing. And if you find something that might be helpful for somebody, even if it is a cure for insomnia, you can feel free to share that with someone uh, who might find this information uh, beneficial. So all this comes back to the greatest commandment that we see. The background for this is Jesus is in a little bit of a repartee with some of the religious leaders and elite. And they had asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? Now, the context of this comes early in Mark chap- in, in the chapter of Mark, comes earlier in that chapter of Mark, where there's some discussion and deliberation about what happens regarding marriage in heaven. And Jesus is like, you're, you're missing the point here. I need you to think about this. You're missing the point because the love that we share for each other here on earth is a critically important component for us to begin to just get the slightest, smallest glimpse 
of the love that God has for us. And so that when we are united with God in heaven, God is going to be our primary relationship. We will still probably know our loved ones, our spices, you know, all those other people. We'll still probably know all those folks. But our primary connection is going to be with God. And so that the love that we experience in the world here is just Well, as the old hymn would say, a foretaste of the glory divine. This is just a glimpse into what living a life of love for eternity will be like. And so Jesus is saying, as he's being challenged about the greatest commandment, he brings it back to this idea of love and moving it from a human earthly experience of love to the heavenly divine experience of love. That's the shift. That's the transformation. And so when Jesus is being challenged about the greatest commandment, He quotes the Shema, which comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, about loving God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And he puts a little twist on it. And today's where we really see that twist come to fruition. So let's look at our core verse for the series from Mark chapter 11, 28 to 31. This is where the scribe asks, Jesus, which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So these are Jesus' words about the greatest of the commandments. It's loving God. Now in the Shema, it mentions loving God with all of your heart and with all of your soul. And with all of your strength. But it does not mention loving God with all of your mind. And there, I think, is a very specific reason for this. When we started the series back on the first Sunday of of November. Listen, it hasn't been that long of a series, I promise. Back in the first Sunday of February. We talked a little bit about how Jesus was calling those who were hearing these words. To think through what it is that they mean. On the heels of talking about the love and the connectedness of marriage as a model for God's love here on earth. Jesus is also saying this will pale in comparison to the experience that you're going to have when you are united with God in eternity and in heaven. So essentially what Jesus is doing, it kind of goes back to the old back to the future reference. You know, think McFly, think is anybody home? Now Jesus isn't being Biff the bully here. But the idea is, is I need you to think about what loving God, others, and self is really all about. I need you to think through what this life of love really means. Think through it. Think through it. So we're going to explore the mind. Because Jesus did not specifically have the mind from the Deuteronomy passage... I had to go back into other areas in the Old Testament where the mind is similarly mentioned to pull the word kerab. I think that's how it's pronounced. Q-E-R-E-B, which in Hebrew means to approach or to bring near, also to consider. To approach, to bring near, to consider. In the Greek, the dionia, we see that the Greek adds the, the texture that says deep thought exercising the mind to think through. So the Greek adds this element, this dimension that talks about really working through, thinking through, trying to discern, to understand, to ascertain what it is that something means. Whereas the Hebrew talks more about bringing it in close or going near to it and able to consider it and able to, uh, to process, to think through and to understand. Now, something that is really, really fascinating in this exchange when it comes to the idea and the context of the mind is that when Jesus used the word that we connect with the Greek dionia, that is not the word that the scribe repeated back to Jesus. Fascinating. There's a very, I think, this is all an educated guess, but I think it's a pretty good theory. There's a reason why that is. Because the word that the scribe used to talk about the mind, focused more on the intellect or his intelligence. Okay? Now, Jesus allowed it. He didn't correct him. But the way that the scribe was likely coming to Jesus, talking about loving God, is he's essentially saying, "Uh, I know. I know. Is there anyone more aggravating in the world than someone when you go to try to tell them something? Oh, I know. 
It's like they know everything. You know they didn't really know it, but they're afraid to show vulnerability or the fact that maybe they didn't exactly know. That's kind of how I read myself into this exchange. But what we really truly see here is that as Jesus is saying to love the Lord your God with all of your mind, it's like the scribe who was trying to challenge Jesus says, oh, I know that. And Jesus is like, I, I'm not sure that you do because it's not just about your intelligence. It's how you take what you know and apply it to how you behave, right? That's the common thread through these messages. It is bringing our belief and our behavior in alignment. And I think that's the context of what Jesus was trying to, to say as he was working through and wrestling with this scribe, at least intellectually, is I need you to, to approach this idea of knowing God or to bring it close to you, to really think through it, to work through it, to try to understand it. Because when you think that you know what it means to love God, you're only getting the slightest sliver of a glimpse of what loving God really, truly means. Think, McFly. Think. Is anyone home? You're basing your complete understanding of this on your understanding of this. And there's so much that you may know, but the greater threat oftentimes comes when we don't know what we don't know, right? So you see on the screen here, I wrote, the mind is our intellect, the place where we analyze, figure out, and plan things, right? It's talking about what we know, and moving it into a future reality where we are working toward that or into that. It is the place where knowledge and understanding are analyzed and manipulated to bring about a conclusion or a decision. Now, I use that word manipulated uh, intentionally because of the verse we're going to read in, read in a few minutes. But I'm not just thinking about, you know, how someone might try to manipulate somebody else with... Uh, a specific interpretation of a fact, but more like the manipulation that you get when you're working through something, uh, maybe like a Rubik's Cube, right, or a puzzle. You're trying to work the various pieces and elements so they all fall in place. They all come together. And this is the idea of the mind we are to work through, to reason through, to think through our understanding of reality so that we can come to a conclusion or a decision. And ultimately that decision comes back to living into the purpose of God, which is of course to make us like Christ, so that we all find our common unity in Jesus, but also allow that common unity to enable and to empower our own unique individual awesomeness to reveal God's glory and to point other people to God. And so we think about the mind and how it can't just be based on what it is that you no, because we do not always know what we do not know, right? I'll say something here about the way that the majority of our brains work. The way that our mind processes information that we have as we're trying to reach a conclusion or to decide or to discern or manipulate a decision that needs to be made. Is our minds work like a motion picture, not a Polaroid, right? We oftentimes will see something and we take it until the Polaroid develops. Uh, I guess y'all didn't find that funny. Anyway, still, <laughs> shake up like a Polaroid. That's not how our, our brains work. Rather, the way our brains work is more to, uh, it, it's, it's like a motion picture. And so we have certain inputs, we have certain data, we have certain things that we know that are kind of like storyboards in making a movie, if you will. We see a point, we see an element, we see something that is there, but we don't see the full picture. We don't see the full complexity and the dynamics of it. But because our brains work like motion pictures, we have to do something to fill in the gaps of that which we do not know. Are you with me so far? So you have certain things that you know, but you don't know it all. And so your brain is working to fill in those gaps. One of the things that is typically true of most people, and I am probably king of this, is that when you don't know what you don't know, your brain tries to fill in those gaps with worst-case scenarios. This is a defense mechanism. It gets back to our psyche. It's a defense mechanism that says, when you're trying to fill in those gaps with the worst-case scenario, you're basically saying, I am preparing for the worst and hoping for the best. Now, does that sound familiar? When you're trying to think through, to process, to work through what it means to use your mind, your mind only has certain inputs. And you fill in the gaps with worst case scenario so that you can prepare for the worst and hope for the best. 
It's a defense mechanism. If you don't sit down and intentionally think through, okay, I'm going to think that this is the absolute worst thing, and then hope that it isn't that bad, it's just natural. It's part of our impulse, the way that we see the world, the way to process the stimuli that we have. God knows this. God created us. God created you even with your defense mechanisms. And so as a result, God wants you to use your mind to think through things so that you begin to see the world not through the lens of your worst case scenario, but through the lens of faith and of hope and of love. Have you ever heard those three words paired up before? God wants you to see the world through the lens of faith and hope and love. Not tragedy and calamity and disaster. But we still tend to do that. John Wesley, who was the founder of the Methodist movement and, and in teaching the, uh, the growing and burgeoning Methodist movement, he, uh, he came up with something he called his quadrilateral. And it may not be specifically unique to Wesley, but Wesley determined or uh, designed it and distributed it in such a way that it really became digestible, so to speak, for the way that we are to look at the world through the lens of faith and hope and love as opposed to disaster and calamity and tragedy. And so there are four points. If you look at it like a compass, uh, I've used the acrostic steer. It's not spelled properly because two le- not enough letters, but work with me, folks. Work with me. The very top, the true north of the Wesleyan quadrilateral is Scripture. The Scripture contains everything that we need to know for salvation. That is, God created us. Sin, dis- sin broke that relationship with God, but God put a plan in motion even as sin entered the world. To remove the barrier that sin created. And that plan was Jesus. To come and save us from our sins. To remove the penalty. To fulfill the wrath of God. So that we can be reunited with God. That's the plan. Scripture tells us that. That when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And believe that God raised him from the dead. And confess in your heart that you have sinned. And you need to be forgiven. You will be saved. That's the gospel. So the scripture contains everything you need to know for salvation. The T with the quadrilateral is tradition. Now we're not talking about just the family traditions like whether or not you eat monkey bread on Christmas morning uh, or you know you have uh, cornbread casserole or whatever you know at certain meals. We're not talking about those types of traditions but the way that the gospel and the way that the truth the truth of the church has developed over the course of these millennia. The traditions of the church, the things that we do like Ash Wednesday and like uh, Holy Thursday or Good Friday, the services that we have, communion, baptism. These traditions bring us closer to that understanding and that awareness of God. The next one is our experience, the way that we experience the scripture in light of the tradition, right? That's how we live into it and we begin to understand that these things aren't just Words contained in a leather-bound book, but they are personal expressions of how God loves us and God wants us to connect with him and to point other people to him in our life and the world. But the R for the quadrilateral is your reason. Folks, hear this. God made you with a brain and he wants you to use it. God wants you to reason through The things that you read in Scripture, the things that you know as life and the church throughout millennia has developed, your own personal experience of it. And he wants you to think through it and to consider it and to manipulate it, not as though you're trying to make something that isn't there, but to put the pieces together to see where you fit in that body of Christ to fulfill that purpose, but also to allow the unique individual awesomeness that is you to shine through. This is how the mind is called to work. It isn't just based on everything you know already. Because we only have a sliver. We only have a glimpse. We only have a piece of what it is that God is going to do in our lives. But if we put our hope and our faith and our love in God, then our mind is opened to all kinds of possibilities and opportunities and chances to experience God in you And to help point people to that faith and that hope and that love that we receive in Jesus. What do you think about that? I think it's pretty awesome. All right, so we're going to go through three little points really quickly to help us get to there. The first thing that we want to look at is the the necessity to renew the mind. 
to renew the mind. One of the, the great passages about the way that the mind works comes from Romans chapter 12, the first five verses. And these verses are out of the English Standard Version. Uh, let, let's read together Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers. You hear that, feel that urgency, right? I appeal to you by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. In other words, it's not just the stuff that you know when you're sitting static. God wants you to live and to move and to find your being with the knowledge that he loves you and he has a plan and a purpose for your life to make you like Jesus, but also to use those unique individual awesome things to help point other people to him. Continuing, do not be conformed to this world. That is the temptation, isn't it? To be conformed to the world. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You feel even Paul here talking about it's acceptable. It's good for you to think through it, to work through it. He continues, for by grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Boy, isn't that a reality check? But to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Again, we're not all alike, right? But we all work together. And then here it gets even awesomer, if that's not a word. But still, for as in one body, we have many members. And the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Now, friends, this gets pretty awesome here. This talks about the integration of the Holy Spirit working through our souls to bring us together. Individuals, unique, with different backgrounds, with different experiences, with different levels of knowledge, with different degrees of faith. God brings us all together, our souls that integrate our thoughts and our feelings and our action are motivated and they are given life and given vitality by the power of the Holy Spirit that is also in the process of weaving us as individual creatures and human beings together to form that one body of Christ. Our souls, empowered and motivated by the Holy Spirit, are being brought together to integrate us into the body of Jesus. And we all have a different role, we all have a different function, but... The body is incomplete without us. And so this is where we get some pretty powerful understanding when we think about the reality that transformation begins in the mind. It begins when you think differently about your life in light of the world that you see. John Wesley, I believe it was attributed to him first, but he said, I want my people... To see the world with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. We can look at the newspaper and we can see all the calamity and the tragedy and we can see all the junk. But I want you to also use the Bible to let you know that there is a future with hope that God is with us. And the power of Christ saves us and the work of the Holy Spirit sustains us. Change the way you think about the world and your life. And as you do, instead of thinking first about the mess and the junk in the world, I want you to think first of God and God's plan. Think first of God and God's plan. I think this is a good time really quickly, and we'll mention this again in a moment, but to think about the scarecrow. Some people go that way, some people go that way. He got all wound up and contorted, talking about the different ways. Got to think about God and God's way. Again, more on that in a moment. The next step is to fix your thoughts. To fix your thoughts. Now, when we look at the word fix here, it has two applications. The first idea of fixing your thoughts is to find the thoughts that are broken and seek to repair them, right? To fix your broken thoughts. But the second understanding of to fix also means to focus your thoughts, Focus your thoughts on God's plan and God's way, right? To embrace God's way, embrace God's will, and to obey God's way. So fixing your thoughts to find the broken ones and to focus on the ones of God. But the temptation is 
to fix our minds on the things that we more easily see, experience, and understand. Right? So let's read together 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. I'm reading this one out of the message version because it brings some of these ideas together really, really well. It says, the tools of our trade, talking about promotion of the gospel, presentation of God's plan, the tools of our trade aren't for marketing or manipulation. Some televangelists need to hear that, right? But I ain't judging. But they are for demolishing that entire massively corrupt culture. Would you say our culture is entirely and massively corrupt right now? The tools of our trade of promoting and presenting the gospel is to bring hope to that. And so we use our powerful God tools, our minds, our words, our actions, the alignment, the, in, the integration of our thoughts and our feelings and our actions. We bring all these together for smashing what philosophies, harder to say than it looks, philosophies, tearing down barriers erected against the truth of God, fitting every loose thought and emotion and impulse into the structure of a life shaped by Christ. Maybe instead of saying fitting those loose thoughts, fixing those loose thoughts, to find where we ourselves have become susceptible to the warped philosophies, the corrupted culture, the barriers that get erected, what thoughts do we need in our lives to fix the ones that are broken and to focus on the ones that are wholesome and healthy, to bring our thoughts and our feelings in line with our actions that we may be shaped into the integrated structure of Jesus. And so again, as I said before, the temptation is to fix our minds on the things that we more easily see, experience, and understand. We should have that on a slide. Yeah, the temptation is we fix our minds on the things that we more easily see, experience, and understand. But we have to be mindful of deception. Two weeks ago, I talked about how the deceiver, the enemy, the devil, tends to play within our thoughts and in our feelings because these are the areas where we are most susceptible to spiritual warfare. And we have to be mindful of deception because our thoughts and our feelings, as we learn from Star Wars, they can betray you, right? They can betray you if you're not careful. You've got to be mindful of deception. And so the advice from Scripture and the more traditional translations and versions of the 2 Corinthians 10 passage is to take your thoughts captive. That's a curious word, isn't it? When Paul wrote it, using the original Greek, when he talked about taking your thoughts captive, it has a very militaristic presentation. The idea is to take the thoughts that are broken, that need to be fixed or repaired, you take them captive as a soldier taking captive a prisoner of war might do and holding them at the tip of a spear or in our day and age at the, at the barrel of a gun. That is the image that Paul wants you and me and all of us to have when we think about taking our thoughts captive is that we find the thoughts that are deceiving us, that are pulling us away from the understanding of how God is at work to take those captive like a soldier would take captive a prisoner of war at the tip of a spear or the barrel of a gun. That has violent connotations to it, doesn't it? But that's the severity of what Paul's trying to impress upon us. That our broken thoughts can run roughshod over us. And if we are going to make them submit to Christ, we ourselves must be submitted to Christ as well. And so we hold them captive and we tell our thoughts, you have no control over me. Jesus is the one who has dominion and authority. I do not want to be deceived into thinking or feeling or fearing otherwise. And so what we need now is thought control. We need godly Thought control. Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 through 4 reads, If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds, or fix your minds, right? But set your minds on things that are above, not 
on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God, like a holy nesting doll. That's my reading into it. Not, it's not on the screen, right? But when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. If we are fixing, oh, sorry, if we're renewing our minds to begin to think through things the way that God would want us to think, and we're fixing our broken thoughts and focusing them on Christ, then we need thought control so that our minds are constantly focused on the things of God, things above, things that are holy, things that are wholesome. We have to work to control our thoughts. In recovery programs, 12-step programs, there's something called stinking thinking, right? This gets back to the idea that your mind works like a motion picture and you're filling in the gaps, the worst-case scenario gaps with, you're filling in the gaps, the worst-case scenario. And so we tend to surrender ourselves to that stinking thinking where we are becoming ourselves subservient to our negative broken thoughts that need to be repaired and to focus on the way of God. And so we need this thought replacement, if you will, so that we are thinking about the things that are holy, the things that are of Christ, the things that are of God, and not thinking about the other stuff that tend to deceive us and to hold us back and to concern us with stuff that isn't of the Lord. And so this is ultimately where we come to the idea of thought replacement. Thought replacement. You see, thoughts have this incredible way of boring themselves into your mind, and it can become almost impossible to think other thoughts unless you intentionally seek to do so. One of my favorite illustrations of this goes back to the author Tolstoy. Tolstoy created something called the White Polar Bear Club. And the only initiation for the White Polar Bear Club was to sit in, on a stool in a room by yourself for eight minutes and not think about a white polar bear. So think about it. If I were to sit here and tell you that we're going to sit here for the next eight minutes, which I'm not going to do, but we're going to sit here, and I want you to think about something other than a white polar bear, and I keep saying white polar bear, what is it you're going to think about? White polar bears. It's the same thing oftentimes, you know, that kind of that self-deprecating humor that happens to me with my pantry. Right now it hasn't been Oreo so much as the frosted animal crackers. But when I know they're in there, and I know I have my protein bars, my protein shakes, uh, it, it's like those, those animal crackers are mooing and neighing and clucking my name, right? And I can't think about anything other than those thought replacements. So we've got to begin to change the way that we think. We find transformation in renewing our mind. We fix our broken thoughts and focus them where they belong. And we have to control the way that we think so that when those deceptive or anxious or worrisome words and thoughts begin to penetrate our mind, we say, no, I got to think about things that are holy. I got to think about things that are godly. I got to think about things that are true. I've got to think about the things that I know. God loves me. He made me, and he wants me to be like Jesus, and he wants me to be united and connected with all of us for the sake of professing and promoting his glory here and forever. I've got to make the choice to go God's way. This brings us to the scarecrow's story. The scarecrow was stuffed by a munchkinland farmer, and... Only two days prior to his encounter with Dorothy, therefore his backstory isn't all that long. But when the Munchkinland farmer stuffed the scarecrow with the purpose of scaring crows, he realized that the crows were not scared of the scarecrow. And so the Munchkinland farmer found something called the potion of life that he gave to the scarecrow so that the scarecrow became an animated living being. Now, this might conjure up biblical thoughts and delusions. Two days, lifeless scarecrow. On the third day, the potion of life comes in and the scarecrow rises and he talks and he thinks, even though he doesn't think he has a brain. Have you ever read something like that before? On the third day, I will live. I don't know if Frank Baum intended all these things, but the truth is always God's truth. And it will shine and it will rise up the cream to the top. So 
that we can begin to get an understanding and a vision for how God wants us to live. This potion of life animated the scarecrow. What is it that we talked about last week with the soul in the Greek? The sutra? That the soul is the animating force that brings vitality to us? That Adam was formed from the dust and the dirt of the ground and God blew into his nostrils and Adam became a living soul? The potion of life. And friends, we're not talking about the potion of life here that's given by some munchkin farmer. What we're talking about is the power of the Holy Spirit that comes into us and to animates us. And it works within our soul to integrate us so our thoughts and our feelings and our actions can be congruent with the plan that God has for you and for me and for all of us in his world. That even when the world feels like it has fallen apart, things may just be falling together. But we have to have that faith and that hope and that love of God. That the worst things that happen to us can never be the last thing. And that God has prepared a home for you and me in heaven. God wants to bring not some potion of life into you, but the power of his very own spirit to animate you. And to bring your soul into integration so that your thoughts, because of your mind, and your heart with your feelings... And your actions are all in agreement with what it is that you say you believe and how it is that you are called to behave for the glory of God. So we all need a scarecrow mind check, don't we? What is the scarecrow mind check? We do one of these for all of our messages in the series. The first is what approach to your thinking do you need to change? What do you need to bring near? What do you need to think through, to work through, to consider differently? What thoughts do you need to take captive, even at the tip of a spear or at the barrel of a gun, proverbially? What thoughts do you need to take captive? And so what must be done for you to think first about God and God's plan? You see, because the scarecrow at first, when he was talking about which way should we go, he said some go that way and some go that way. When we're not thinking clearly about God's way, we will get wound up, we will get tied up, We will get twisted. But when we commit our lives to thinking through what it is that God wants us to do based on how he created us and he wants us to live, then we don't find ourselves so twisted up in our own understanding of the way. But we become untwisted, unbound, and we find God's way. May we think through that this morning, this week, the rest of our lives. May we think through that so that we can bring the understanding of God's love for us close. Even though we're only going to begin to grab just the tiniest little morsel of what it means to be loved by God and to love others. And as we so do, to remember that transformation happens when we begin to change the way that we think. To fix those broken thoughts and to focus them where they belong. And to keep controlling those thoughts. They don't become our undoing, but they point us to what it is that God wants us to do for him in faith and hope and love with an integrated soul that shows our thoughts, our feelings, and their actions are completely formed and fueled by the love of God. Amen? As the band comes forward, I want to open up our altar here this morning that if you need to go through a scarecrow mind check, you need to do it here or you do it in your chair, wherever, to change your approach to thinking, this is the time to do it, to take those thoughts captive which are deceiving you and holding you back so that you can be unwound and untwisted and find God's way, God's way of sacrifice and service and salvation. This is your moment. This is your time. So maybe take it seriously. And to think through how it is that God wants us to live. And to move and to find our being in him. Pray with me please. Living and loving God, I thank you for today. And I thank you for what we can see and what we can learn from a character. Even like the scarecrow. Lord, all of us need to have our minds renewed. And to find the transformation that comes as a result. We need to fix our broken thoughts. And focus on the things that you want for us. And to help us control those thoughts. To help us keep in 
just in control, the things that tend to cause us to feel deceived or depressed or disheveled or just diffed. And so, Lord God, as we bring this service to a close, I pray that we make ourselves available to you, that you may come and work within our minds to change the way that we think, to fix those broken thoughts and to focus on the things of you and of your plan for us. And so, Lord God, bless us and keep us and work within our thoughts to help fuel our actions and to hold our feelings in check that we may live for you according to the plan and the purpose you have for our lives. I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen.